Y'all were wondering if I was going to do that, weren't you? All right, I would like you to turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. This, this passage has been used by lots of um, churches, denominations, groups, cults, to prove or demonstrate that the believer can lose their salvation. What would be the advantage? What would be, why would someone try to prove that you can actually lose your salvation? Yeah, that's right, babe. They want you to walk the line. They want you to walk the line. That's not a bad motive. They want you to lock, walk the line. But to distort the scripture in order to do that, that's wrong. That's not right. And um, if you read this passage, even at a surface level, if they believe you can lose it, then they believe you could never get it back. And none of them teach that. I've been in a lot of contexts overseas where the the whole denomination believes you can lose your salvation. I'm like, well, this passage says if you do lose it, you can't get it back. If that's what the context of the passage is. Oh, no, 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 you can get it back. You know, you just come back to church. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> All right, well, it doesn't make sense. We're taking the passage out of context. And um, others, on the other hand, if you read commentaries, most of the commentaries will say, that, well, this passage is actually talking to people who thought they were believers or people who aspired to believers but weren't or people who were almost believers but weren't. This can't be talking to believers because it talks about the fire that they will inherit if they don't repent. And we're going to talk about that. But I want to read verses 1 through 8. And it's probably going to take us three weeks to get through chapter 6 here in, in Hebrews. But today I'm going to walk through 1 through 8. So let's read that together. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. 1977. Sounds old, doesn't it? Um, okay, New American Standard, 1970. I don't care what translation you, you use. I'm just saying that. All right. Therefore, verse 1, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. You might ask, well, what will we do? Verse 1 says, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, and pressing on to maturity. That's what he's talking about doing. Verse 4. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then having fallen away, or and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. And, of course, people who believe you can lose your salvation would say, well, the falling away is losing your salvation. That's not what it says in the context, but that's what they'd say. That's the meaning they would assign to those, that term, falling away. Verse 7 says, For ground that drinks the rain which often falls upon it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. It's interesting. This issue of salvation, now he's talking about the ground and the dirt. And then verse 8, But if it yields thorns and thistles, it's worthless and close to being cursed and ends up being burned. That's what you do with worthless land. You burn it, and it will add nutrients to the soil, and then you till it and plant it the next year. We'll talk about what the burning means here, which is not the lake of fire, but what it means here in this context. So verse 1, leaving, therefore leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. What is he talking about that? What's he referring to? Well, if you look back in chapter 5, verse 12, he says, 
you, you, verse 11, he says, you've be, you become dull of hearing, you're immature spiritually and you should be mature. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. You've, become, you've come to need milk and not solid food. He's, he's ranting on their immaturity. They should be mature, but they've become immature. And there's a reason. It's because they've gone back under a system of legalism, which, listen, y'all, stunts your spiritual growth. Why? It makes perfect sense. It neutralizes, this is Galatians chapter 3, it neutralizes the work of the Spirit in your life. So that's going to stunt your spiritual growth. It's going to stunt your faith. And that's the whole message of the, the book of Hebrews, practically. So verse chapter 6, verse 1, he says, Leaving these elementary tr truths, let us press on to maturity. So that's the exhortation that frames this chapter or this portion of this chapter, verses 1 to 8, or 1 to 9, okay? Verse 9 says, skip to verse 9, Beloved, we're concerned of better things concerning you. In other words, I don't want these things to happen to you. I think better things will happen because why? Because you're obedient to what I'm going to say. We'll get back to that. Leaving the elementary principles of Christ. So, Let's move on, guys, from the ABCs, is what he's saying. What has happened? And then he wants to press on. But what has happened to these Jewish believers? I want you to think through what they might be thinking. The Jewish believer at the time first identified Jesus as the Messiah, that was a breakthrough for them. As a, young, as a Jew, they were taught that the Messiah was going to come. And the Messiah was going to establish his kingdom. And we will no longer be slaves of the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and now the Romans. We won't be their property. We won't be the tail. We'll be the head. So they were looking for the Messiah. And the bulk of the Material in the Old Testament, the bulk of the prophetic words spoke about the king that comes in the line of David and reigns and establishes his kingdom. There is a sliver of prophecy in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, just a few passages that talk about the Messiah dying on the cross. They didn't see that. Not even the disciples did they see that. After three years of ministry, they didn't understand that or see that. It was a stumbling block. It was a stumbling block. But they realized, well, Jesus, after they had acknowledged him as the Messiah, they saw him as the Messiah, he was crucified by their leadership because of their leadership. He died and he rose from the dead. And that was, that was the amazing thing. This is the, the preaching of the book of Acts. The Messiah came. He died. He rose from the dead. But where is he? He's in heaven. He's in heaven. And Jesus taught in Matthew 24. You can read that. The Olivet Discourse. Jesus taught about his coming. When the disciples asked him, they said, Lord, tell us about your coming. And the signs of the end of the age. And he talks about the tribulation period. And then he will come and establish his, king, establish his kingdom. So that tied everything together as far as the Old Testament prophecy was concerned. But he's in heaven now. And having believed in him, these are Jewish believers, they received the sign of the new covenant. What was that? It was the Spirit of God being planted in their hearts. You read about that in Jeremiah 30 to 33, in Ezekiel 34 to 39. They knew about that, and Jesus said, wait for it. And to the Jews, this is hard for some to understand, but I think it's pretty simple. In 1 Corinthians 14, it said, for the Jewish group of believers, for the Jews, when the Holy Spirit came on Gentiles, and they could see the Gentiles speaking in tongues, that was a sign to the Jews that the Holy Spirit had, in fact, come to the Gentiles, a physical, audible sign that they could see. But when they received the Holy Spirit, they knew, okay, the new covenant 
which was written about in Jeremiah 30 to 33 and Ezekiel 34 to 37 or 39, the new covenant has been inaugurated. And with the new covenant, we have received forgiveness of sins. We have received a new heart. All of this was in the Old Testament prophecy. You don't even have to have the New Testament to understand this, and, but they're, they're experiencing it as a new believer. We're experiencing the indwelling Holy Spirit. They were experiencing and understanding the cleansing, forgiving, cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Um, if you look in the passage in verse Verse 1, it says, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works. We're going to deal with that in just a minute. And faith toward God of instruction about washings. Some of your translations say baptisms, but it's in the plural. It's not talking about them getting baptized so that they will identify themselves with Jesus Christ, baptized one time. These are washings. These are ceremonial washings that were very common under the old system. And then it says, um, laying of hands and, and laying on of hands and the resurrection of dead and the eternal judgment. These people had experienced and knew that they had the new heart. The new heart. They were born again. They had forgiveness of sins. They had the indwelling Holy Spirit. They had the cleansing that didn't come from the water in the temple or the blood of bulls and goats or of the, the washings, the, all the ceremonial washings that they had to do um, in connection with the ceremonial law because of getting defiled or made unclean. But they were cleansed by faith. They're all growing in this. This is a, a learning curve for all of the Jews. Um, they were understanding that they're cleansed forever because of faith in Christ, meaning they're forgiven of all their sins, and that by faith in confessing their sin to the Lord, they experienced a daily cleansing um, without even going to the temple, without even washing their hands. Um, think about Peter when he was on the rooftop in Acts chapter 10, before he goes to see Cornelius, um, he has a dream. He's hungry. He has a dream. And in the dream, a sheet comes down out of heaven. It has all these animals. And there, there were unclean animals on the sheet. And in the vision, God tells Peter, he says, arise, Peter, kill and eat. Well, he's hungry, right? And what does he say? By no means. Lord, I have never eaten anything unclean. He was a good Jew abiding by the law. And God says, well, what God has declared clean, let no man consider unclean. And he did that to tell Peter, basically, Peter, I'm going to have you go into a Gentile's house. I know you've never been inside a Gentile's house, but I'm going to have you go inside a Gentile's house. And so they're experiencing these things that freed them from the burden of the Mosaic law. But you had the burden of the Mosaic law, but then you had the, the, high, the priest, um, the elders, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, and the traditions of the elders that were just an elaborate um, system of regulation to keep people way away from violating the law. Um, it's like a barbed wire fence built around the wall built around the law of Moses to keep people far away from violating the law of Moses. But it had all these loopholes how they could get in and they could actually sin and get away with it and appear righteous. But these believers were being freed from that. And um, I want to give you an idea of what it felt like, what it felt like to them. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians and Galatians and several places throughout the New Testament in the book of Acts, um, Paul is dealing with the Judaizers. And those were um, Jews that were coming, that were influencing Gentiles to be 
circumcised and to obey the law of Moses. And if you read Acts chapter 15, it, talk, it walks through what happened in Jerusalem, the Jerusalem Council, um, in regard to that. But Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And by the way, this is written to a Jew and Gentile audience mixed. But the Gentiles were being pressured by some of the Judaizers to become bap- to be baptized. I'm sorry, to be circumcised and obey the law, to bring them back under the law. Similar to what was going on with these Hebrew believers. He says, to write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it's a safeguard for you. In other words, I'm writing these things to help you be free from this bondage. Verse 2 says, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. You remember last week we talked about what good and evil, the difference between good and evil, and evil is seeing something and thinking that it's good, but it's really rebellion to God. And these dogs, which was a real cut down, um, these evil workers were the Judaizers. They were trying to get people to look pristine and look good on the outward appearance. They were trying to win them over to their form of legalism. And you see that in Galatians chapter 3, where Paul says, who has bewitched you? We read that last, last week. He says in verse 3, For we are the true circumcision, or we are the circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ, not ourselves, he says, and put no confidence in the flesh. We glory in Jesus Christ because he bought our redemption. His blood cleanses me. And we worship by means of the Spirit of God. Why? Because God's Holy Spirit lives in us. We're under the new covenant, not the old covenant. Verse 4. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, that would be the teacher of the law, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. That was seen as a good thing as far as the people under that system was concerned. As to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. This is like Peter saying, no way, Lord, I've never done this before. Paul's not saying he's perfect, because when he sinned, he would make the right sacrifice at the temple. He would make it make up for it. In fact, the scripture calls men, elders, to be blameless before the Lord and before man. That doesn't mean you don't sin. It means you deal with the sin when you do sin. And Paul dealt with it under that system. He says, But whatever things were gained to me, these things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing knowledge of knowing, I'm surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I consider them rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. That is, the stuff that I was doing to gain acceptance before God, those things I consider worse than anything because they were hindering me from making contact with God. That I may be found in him, verse 9, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Okay, if you'll go back to Hebrews 6. This exhortation is to believers that were moving into that system, that were going back to that system that would suffocate believers in legalism, that would neutralize the Spirit of God's work in their life, and it would neutralize their faith, because now everything I do is by sight. Verse 3 says, And this we will do, what? Go on to maturity. This we will do if God permits. 
if God permits. A lot of people will interpret this and say, well, what God is going to do or what God could do, you better be careful because he might reach down, he might neutralize your will so that you can't repent. God's going to just reach in and he's going to change your mind. God may permit you to repent. God may not permit you to repent. You better flip a coin and say a prayer. It's not what it's saying. It's not what it's saying. It's introducing the urgency, the urgency of the message. If God permits. Let me say a different way. If God's judgment doesn't fall first. At this time, if the timing of this epistle is in the late 60s, Titus is already mounting siege works practically or has decimated Judea and working on Jerusalem to take Jerusalem. These people were re-identifying themselves with that system. I want you to think of the judgment that fell on the Israelites in Numbers 21. You don't need to turn there. But it was when the Israelites were murmuring and complaining. Do you remember that? And the Lord sent snakes. And the, they were poisonous snakes. They were biting the Jewish, the, the people in the wilderness. And they were dying. So they came to Moses. They said, intercede for us. And Moses prayed. And God told Moses to, put a bronze, to make a bronze serpent and put it on the staff. It's what you see on every ambulance. You're following an ambulance. You see that. And... um. He said, lift it up, and everyone who's been bitten by a snake and is dying, when they looks at it, they will live. They will live. What happened? Well, the judgment had already begun to fall, and in a hurry, if these people would look at the snake, the serpent on the staff, which is a representation of Jesus Christ on the cross, okay, identified with our sin, they would live. They would live. Judgment had been called by God. People were already dying, but they could be delivered from it. But there was a tremendous urgency in it. Now I want you to fast forward and go to John the Baptist. You don't need to read it, but it's in Matthew chapter 3. When John the Baptist is calling Israel to repent. Israel was in a state of apostasy, but not like the apostasy that they had experienced during before the Babylonian captivity where they were worshiping idols in the temple and all kinds of horrible things were going on and God moved in and just decimated Jerusalem and the temple, carried them off into captivity. When they came back, you never see idolatry as a big deal anymore in Israel or as a problem in Israel. But they were in apostasy, a different kind of apostasy. They were worshiping in Herod's temple. It was an amazing structure. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the rulers of the Jews, the high priests, the scribes, they were the the reigning religious aristocracy of the day. And they called the shots. And they were so far away from God that Jesus just lambasts them in Matthew, Matthew 23. I would encourage you to read Matthew 23. Those are the woes on the, on the leaders of the Jews. They were so entrenched in a system of religiosity, it was purely satanic, purely satanic. Judgment, he said, is coming, specifically on Jerusalem. And that was about 35 years before this epistle is written. And these believers were being tempted to go back under that system where God was just about to judge, and I mean decimate, physically judge the people. Why? Because he had done that century after century after century. And you're going to see it in, chapter, in verse, verse 7 and 8. But this, this sets, kind of sets the stage for verse 4. Verses 4 to 6 are the most difficult portion of this passage, which most commentators would say would be the most difficult portion of the book of Hebrews. But verse 4 says, verse 3 again, and this we will do if God permits, or this we will do 
if God's judgment doesn't fall first. So you better pay attention. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, have tasted the heavenly gift, and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and have fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Now that sounds like, when you read it, that sounds like, well, somebody just lost their salvation. Those who do not believe you can lose your salvation will take those statements, and I think there's like four or five of them. They've been, they've been enlightened. They've tasted the heavenly gift. They've been partakers of the Holy Spirit. They've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Four different things. You read the commentaries, and they'll tell you, they, these do not mean, this is what they'll say, these do not mean these people were saved. They're trying to get the saved people out of the passage because they believe verses six, verses, um, six, verse six means they lost their salvation. I don't believe it means they lost their salvation at all. I, mean, I believe that it means they're about to lose their lives just like everybody else in Jerusalem. Let's look at it. It says these believers had been enlightened. They've been enlightened. It doesn't say by what or for what. It doesn't say what the enlightenment was. It doesn't even say what the heavenly gift is. It does say that they've partaken of the Holy Spirit. But they've been enlightened. They've been enlightened. So does that mean they're saved? Well, the same author in chapter 10, turn there, chapter 10, verse 32 the same author uses the same term speaking to the same people in parallel to the same type of exhortation. Chapter 6 and chapter 10 are both warning passages. And he goes on and he's saying, well, start in verse 28. No, start in verse 27. Yeah, 28. No, start in verse 26. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Let's just go to 26. For if we go on sinning willfully, is he talking believers or unbelievers, you think? Believers throughout the entire epistle. After receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. What? I can't be forgiven? He's not talking about that. But a certain terrifying expectation of judgment and a fury of fire which will consume the adversaries huh that means hell fire right hell look at me real close everybody listen if you believe that you have not read the old testament israel's history is extremely consistent in experiencing god's judgment his temporal physical judgment because of their disobedience he goes on to say Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies. Is that eternal death? He's not talking about that. He's talking about the Mosaic law. They die physically without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. You can see that in Deuteronomy 18. How much more, how much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? Now remember, these are people that are openly, they had openly gotten saved, they were baptized, they had made a public confession, and now they're re-identifying with that group that they had walked away from and experienced so much pressure and persecution by walking away. He says, how much more severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as an unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? He was sanctified saved and has insulted the spirit of grace by going back under the law remember paul in galatians 3 says who bewitched you guys he says was it by the works of the law you've been sanctified no was it by it was by the hearing of faith verse 31 no verse 30 for we know him 
who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Read the Old Testament. You will see this over and over again. They were subject. Every single, every single prophet, except Nahum, who was speaking to Nineveh, every single prophet was by God's design sent at a period of apostasy, calling Israel to repentance so that they don't incur the judgment that God has promised. Most of the time, they rejected the word of the prophets. The judgment came. It caused serious pain. They would repent. Ultimately, God would restore them to a place of blessing. And when they were blessed, they grew fat and happy and they formed bad habits morally. And a prophet would come and warn them of a coming judgment. If they continued to do that, they would reject the prophet um, in rebellion and God would judge them again. This was their history. A Jew reading this, think is, when he says, vengeance is mine, I will pay. It's a terrible thing, verse 31, to fall in the hands of the living God. They're not, they know, well, this isn't talking about the lake of fire. This is talking about the whoopings, the woodshed times that we have spent as a nation over and over and over throughout our history. And who is the book of Hebrews written to? Jewish believers who are fully aware of this. But remember, verse 32, remember the former days. When after being enlightened, that's our word that we we're, we're saw in, chapter, in verse chapter 6. They were enlightened. Same words, same word, same context. After you were enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings. So listen, they were enlightened. They believed in Jesus as the Messiah. They were rejected, marginalized, put away, and, and persecuted by that religious aristocracy that crucified Christ. And they endured a great conflict of suffering. And then he says, partly by being made a what spectacle? Spectacle. Public spectacle. They were marginalized publicly and, and made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations. And partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated because or for you, show, you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, don't throw away your confidence. Listen, these believers had gone a long way in the Lord. They had endured a lot as born-again believers, Jews. And they had, accept, they had received so much difficulty from the Jewish culture of the day. And that's what I'm saying. It's coming to a head in a lot of their lives. And to release that pressure of the persecution... They're re-identifying themselves with this system. Problem is, 35 years after Christ has pronounced judgment, and John the Baptist pronounced judgment, John the Baptist says, the axe is laid at the foot of the trees. Judgment is coming. It's like those snakes, they're already biting people. They're re-identifying themselves with them. And that nation is under the imminent judgment of God. And that's why these warning, that's what these warning passages are all about. If you understand that, y'all, it makes the book of Hebrews so simple, so easily, easy to understand. Most commentaries will say, well, chapter 3, chapter 6, and chapter 10, some of the most difficult passages in the, in the New Testament. They're not. Because he's not talking about going to hell. He's talking about being judged by God as a believer going back into reversionism. Okay, let me give you an example. I just thought of this. Okay. Oh, this is a good example. <laughs> My Pentecostal friends would say, thank you, Holy Ghost. <laughs> okay, you're a girl. And she's 17. And she falls head over here. She's a believer. She falls head over heels for the knight in shining armor. He's got a face full of hair, a face full of teeth, and a head full of hair, a pocket full of cash. And she goes after him. And they start, and, and she was strong with the Lord, but she starts to compromise because he might not even be saved or he's not walking with the Lord, but he has nothing to do with God. And she begins to compromise and make some bad decisions. Then they move in together. And now, now, now she's in deep. 
Why did I use this illustration? This is good. I know it's coming. The Holy Spirit should have gave me the rest of it. <laughs> okay, hold on a second. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, no, I forgot the first part. Okay, the first... I'm sorry, y'all. This is terrible. The first part is she is in a place of blessing. Because she's born again. She's walking with the Lord. Then she meets the guy. And she leaves that and goes back under this system, okay, of immorality. Now, our context is a system of religious legalism. But she goes back under the system of immorality. And one day they're in a car and he's high and he slams into the telephone pole and she goes through the windshield, Christians would call that, and I've done several funerals of such, the sin unto death. That God was like, well, okay, I'm going to take you home. The consequences of sin. Would she have experienced that had she stayed in church? Had she stayed walking with the Lord? Would she have experienced that? Yes or no? The answer is no. The answer is no. There are so many different examples After they were enlightened, they suffered tremendous persecution and difficulty. But they were freed. They were freed from this system that brought condemnation. They were freed from the system that was under God's judgment. His judgment judgment just hadn't fallen yet. And they're just about to go back under that system. And they're going to meet the judgment of God. And it's physical and temporal. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Go back to Hebrews 6. That doesn't mean it's not the Holy Spirit when it's not in my notes. Okay? Hebrews 6 verse 4 says, For in the case of those who have been enlightened, and these had been enlightened, you can write next to that, Hebrews 10 verse 32, they had been enlightened, and have tasted the heavenly gift. There's people that say, well, you can't believe, be believers because they lose their salvation. I'm saying they're not losing their salvation. They're going to lose their physical life. But, well, they can't be believers. So these only tasted the heavenly gift. Why does he say just tasted the heavenly gift? Well, there's another word that Paul uses, the same word in Hebrews 2. If you read Hebrews 2 verse 9, and you know what it says? It says Jesus tasted death. For all of us, did he really die? Yes or no? Don't look in your Bible, your study Bibles, because a lot of your study Bibles, I've checked them, okay, will say differently. Jesus tasted death. Did he really die? Yes, he did. And this, you tasted the heavenly gift. It doesn't say what the heavenly gift is, but they tasted it. Would you say it might be eternal life? The gift of eternal life? It might be... The Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, they tasted it. Did it mean they, they, just, they just tasted it and ran away? They weren't really saved? No. How much of eternal life do you have to say, taste to have eternal life? The nature of the word eternal? <laughs> okay. How much of it do you need to have eternal life? Well, you just need a little bit, I guess. There's some of it because it's eternal. And you get all of it. Thank you. They tasted the heavenly gift. And by the way, how much faith does it take to taste the heavenly gift? The mustard seed, child of faith, I mean, uh, faith of a child. Think back to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes will not perish, but have everlasting life. It's prefaced by John 3, 14 and 15. And that tells you the quality or the quantity of faith you actually have to have. What does John 3, 14 and 15 say? We just referenced it in Numbers chapter 21. Remember? The the murmuring Israelites got bit by snakes and they were dying and Moses put the, the serpent on the, the staff and raise it up. He said, whoever looks will live. That's the illustration. 
that Jesus used in John 3, 14 and 15. Read that and, and write in your Bible Numbers 21 because that's the illustration. Why is that significant? Well, what did the person I get? Oh, I got bit by a snake. I'm dying. I'm dying, Moses. Well, what are you supposed to do? Look at the thing. <sighs> I'm, I'm living again. And then what does he say in verse 15? It says, look, John, this is so important. Because people say, well, they didn't, they didn't truly believe. Well, what do you mean? That's oxymoronic. They believed. Well, they didn't truly believe. They, if they believed, they believed. Even weakly, they believed. It says, as Mo, verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes may in him, Jesus, have eternal life. When they looked at the, the serpent on the, on the staff, they had physical life again. They weren't going to die. The people who died, they're toast. Didn't say they get raised from the dead. It was only those living. They were in the middle of a judgment of God. They looked to the serpent on the staff that represented Christ, and they got physical life again. But this passage says, whoever believes in him will have eternal life. And then, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Y'all, listen. Faith in Christ, even if it's a little faith, even if it's a weak faith, even if it's just a mustard seed of faith, even if it's just like a little child, innocent faith, not a lot of knowledge, not a lot of apologetics, just faith in Christ. I want to get out of hell. I want to get into heaven. I want my sins forgiven. I heard that Jesus died for my sins. I'm believing in him. Period. Plus nothing else. Gets you eternal life. How long does that go? Until you screw up again? It's eternal life. Isn't it amazing? You have eternal life and you're living physically why should you be afraid of dying? We, we're not. I was talking to Derek Lastra. He's legitimately on his deathbed. And, and he has a very clear, childlike understanding of faith and of eternal life and his relationship with God. You're going to go to sleep and you're going to wake up and you're either going to see your mother's beautiful face or you're going to see Jesus and a big old smile. Face to face with Jesus. Anybody can understand it. A child can understand it. Anybody can receive it. Whoever's been bit by the serpent. They can receive it and live. Have you been bit by the serpent? You bet your bottom dollar you have. And are you going to die? You bet your bottom dollar you, you are. You have spiritual AIDS. You're going to die. Just look and live, period. Taste. Taste. Back in Hebrews 6. You've tasted of the heavenly gift and you've, made, you've been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. How can this person not be saved? I, listen, commentaries will tell you, well, they're not saved. They're just a partaker. What? What does it mean? That's the same word he uses again in chapter 2. He's, that's the metakoi. That's, that's like the ultimate term. You're, you're a sharer in this. You own it. You're an inheritor of this. Ephesians chapter 1 I hope, this, I hope this is encouraging because it doesn't take much for you to have eternal life. Look, look up here. This is what it takes for you to have eternal life. That's a lot. That's the God of the universe in a human body paying the full penalty for all your sins. That's what it took. What does it take from you? faith. What does that mean? I believe it. I believe he died for me, for my sin. Is it easy to believe? Yes. 
What do you sometimes have to repent of? He's going to say it here. Dead works. Dead works. Who is the hardest person oftentimes to lead to the Lord? Jehovah Witness? A hardcore Catholic? Who, who, there's a lot of Catholics that are saved. But someone who's trusting. When you're sharing Christ, I used to do this all the time. Going door to door with my job for 20 years. Talk to him about the Lord. Don't don't talk to me about Jesus. I'm Catholic. That happened a lot. I'm like, okay, I understand where they're at. They have a lifetime invested in a system, just like these Jews did. A lifetime investment in this system, not only to get you to heaven, but keep you right before God. Okay? And I'm saying it's not necessary. They simply have to believe in Christ. And I've knocked it three doors down. Very open to the gospel. Yes, I believe that. Where do you go to church? I go to St. Anthony's Catholic Church. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I've been born again since I was 15 years old. Walking with the Lord. Same church. Same church. You will find born again Catholics all day long. You will find not born again Catholics all day long. And usually in the left wing Protestant churches, a mainline Presbyterian or Methodist church or whatever, you will find a lot of people. Well, I go to church, man. Don't give me all that Jesus stuff. Where do you go to church? Methodist, that's, that's, that's their Methodist church. And, you know, I go to Easter services and stuff, man. Leave me alone. Man, they don't know their word. They don't know the Bible. They're not learning the Bible. And the pastor's probably not teaching that you have to be born again. You have to look and live. You have to place your faith in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse verse 13, it says, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, Hebrews 6 says, You were partakers of the Holy Spirit. Had he become a partaker of the Holy Spirit, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13? Hear it, hear the gospel, and believe, period. We're not going to front end load the gospel. Well, you didn't really believe because you wouldn't have said that dirty word. No, I believed. This passage says I was sealed. And then in chapter 4, it says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside me, and I'm sinning, so I'm grieving the Holy Spirit. It says, don't do that. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed unto the day of redemption. If you've placed your faith in Christ, and you're walking in the flesh, you're quenching the Spirit of God, or you're grieving the Spirit of God. But He doesn't leave you. Isn't that good news? Jesus said, I'm not ever going to leave you ever under any circumstance. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 38 and 39, nothing, not even you. I've heard so many people say, well, I can separate myself. Go ahead. But you can't separate yourself from his love for you, which is in Jesus Christ. You're saved, period. You're secure in that. You can't lose that. You can't lose that. You've been partakers of the Holy Spirit. You're sealed under the day of redemption. And then it says they had tasted, the word means to eat, experience the good word and the powers of the age to come. The good word. 1 Thessalonians 1, you can read that, verse 12. Verse 13, Paul's basically saying, I'm so proud of you guys because you heard the word, you believed that it was God's word and not just the word of man, which does its work, which effectively works in those who believe. When you trust God's word just one time, he does a work in your life. And then the powers of the age to come. We're not going to just gloss this. The powers of the age to come. What's the age to come? Help me. The Messianic kingdom. That's the age to come. And the powers of the age to come 
come promised in Jeremiah and Ezekiel to Israel under the new covenant. The power of the age to come is the spirit of God working in the lives of the entire, in the whole earth, on the whole earth. It's an amazing outpouring of the spirit of God in the age to come. It's not the church age and it's not the church overtaking the world. That's post-millennialism. It's God, the Holy Spirit, being poured out on all flesh. Have we had a taste of that in the church age? Look at you, you're a bunch of Gentiles. Has the Holy Spirit not poured out on all flesh? Yes. But when he says you tasted, that's what we tasted, the powers of the age to come, that, really prom- that promise really was for the age to come. Do you all understand that nothing about the church age was prophesied in the Old Testament? Nothing about the church age was prophesied in the Old Testament. And when Paul comes along and he's teaching all this, this is deemed a mystery, a mystery age, previously unrevealed. But they've tasted these powers. Verse 6, verse 6. Hebrews 6, verse 6. First, let me ask you, are these believers? Yes or no? Thank you. These are believers. They've been, verse 1, they've been called to maturity. And they've been exhorted, if you lapse back into this legalistic system, you're falling under their judgment. Okay? But you're also being hardened in a position of rebellion or a position of self-righteousness. These, these people have experienced salvation. They've made a public confession in their baptism. They've lived openly for him, Hebrews 10, 30, 32. They've been rejected by the religious aristocracy of the day. And now they're moving back into a system of law that God is, that is under God's judgment. They've become a part of the church. What's the, the, the word ecclesia, church, means to be called out. They've been called out of this system, okay? And now they're going back to the system. It just so happens that that system at this particular period of history is under God's judgment. And you moved right in line. Girls, remember my, my analogy about y'all jumping in the car with the guy that's this donor or whatever? Okay, you just jumped back into his car at the wrong time. At the wrong time. And that's the warning here in Hebrews. You've, you've, gone, a, you've gone away. You fell away. Okay. Um, it says it's impossible to restore them to repentance. It's impossible to restore them to repentance. Number one, for people who believe this is, this is an, a believer losing their salvation then apparently if they lost their salvation, they can't get it back. And most of them will say, oh, no, you can get it back. Well, then this verse doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. But what does it mean they're... um, Hold on a second. It's impossible to renew them to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. Their hearts are hardened, and you can look in Philippians chapter 3. They're rejoining a group of people in solidarity solidarity that have rejected Christ, and God's judgment is falling. God's judgment is falling. Their heart being hardened is what is causing them not to repent. They're justifying They're justifying their rebellion before God. Again, y'all, this happens over and over and over again throughout Israel's history to where they reach a point in that cycle of discipline where they've rejected, they've rejected, and God says, okay, I'm turning you over to judgment. I'm judging you. I'm not warning you. I'm judging you. And it's too late. It's too late. I want to give you an assignment. 
Okay? Write down Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 to 20. Deuteronomy 30, 15 to 20. If you want a broader context, it's Deuteronomy chapter 28 all the way through chapter 30. That is Israel's history. Every Jew reading this clearly understood that. They never even had to have it explained to them. It's just, look y'all, Gentiles who have to have it explained to them. Okay, The Jews understood this very clearly. Israel's history is replete with God's judgment because of their rebellion. The judgment was real and physical. Moses, we talked about this last week, Moses experienced that judgment and Moses himself died in the wilderness. He did not inherit the promises because of what? Sin. Because of sin, striking the rock. Twice. And this judgment is physical, it's temporal, and it's corporate. What are we going to do next week? We're going to read, well, I'll just read it now. For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it, and brings forth fruit or veg vegetation useful to those whose forsake it was also tilled, receives a blessing from God. Listen, the ground is Israel, and they've been drinking rain, Prophet after prophet after prophet's been coming, bringing the word of God to Israel. The word is like rain in, in Isaiah chapter 55. And they've rejected it. They didn't receive it. If they received it, it would produce a blessing. That's Deuteronomy 28 to 30. But they rejected it, rejected it. Look in verse 8. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it's worthless, the land, and close to being cursed. Get that? Close. To being cursed. Okay. That's right where these believers were. And it ends up being burned. I would encourage you. Google this. Josephus. A Jewish historian. And he was there the entire time. During the siege of, of Jerusalem. 70 AD. When it fell. And then Masada. 73 AD. When it fell. And it will turn your stomach. To see what happened to people in Jerusalem, and in Judea because of God's judgment that was pronounced by John the Baptist and Jesus and reiterated here right before it fell. That is the context of this passage. So we don't want to theologize this passage to make it fit a theological paradigm that we have that's not what is going on here. All right, I'm done. Let's pray. Let's pray. I see you, Carly, looking at you. <laughs> Do y'all know? Look, hey, look up here. Do y'all know how many people I see actually look at their watches? And you're trying to be sly, like Joe Biden, looking at the watch. I see it. I give you grace. I know, because I used to be on your end. I'm not. I'm sorry. Two minutes. If I was, that's two minutes. If I was Pentecostal, it could be 20 minutes and y'all would have to sit there because it all came from the Holy Ghost. <laughs> She'll never do that again. She'll be a lot more careful next time. <laughs> all right, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your word. We want, to, we want to grow in it. We want to understand it. We want to have a holy reverence for your judgment when it falls on believers. We've seen it happen to many believers going back into the world. And we've also seen believers going back into a legalistic system that hardens their heart against grace, against truth, ultimately against Jesus Christ. We thank you for the goodness that we have partaken of, that we have eaten the goodness of your word and your spirit living in us. It's our desire to grow in that grace. In Jesus' name, amen.